The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This is, this is a little review we're having. The Spirit of Jesus, we've taught that the Spirit of God already existed from eternity past when Jesus was sent to earth as the Son of Man. And yet, Jesus said in John 7, 37 through 39, on the last day, on the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So speaking of the rivers of living water, this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now we could never say that the Holy Spirit was not yet because the Holy Spirit had existed from eternity past. But the Spirit mentioned here by the Lord Jesus was not yet, apparently. This is what our Messiah spoke. So what does this mean? It means that this Spirit of which Jesus spoke must be something new and different from the Spirit of God. So the divine Spirit, let's call the Spirit of God the divine Spirit. Formerly, the Spirit of God was of divine essence only. But after the resurrection of our Messiah, the Spirit that Jesus was to give to man was constituted of something more. You see, Jesus not only had the divine essence because he was one with the Father, one with the Spirit, but now there was a human essence that the Spirit of God came in the Son of Man and was mingled, was mixed with his humanity. And we talked about how Jesus is still in heaven as the Son of Man. Stephen saw the Son of Man standing by the throne of God when the heavens were opened to him. In the book of Revelation, we see the Son of Man walking in the midst of the candlesticks. It's the Son of Man who said, I will build my church and is building it in and through his people. The Son of Man, something new was formed, was constituted, that had never existed before. And it is this spirit, the divine humanity of Jesus, that we partake of. See, there's something that's tremendously huge about Jesus being the Son of Man. Moreover, he said that as the captain of salvation, he had come to bring many sons to glory that he was the captain, the pioneer, the leader of something brand new that was taking place historically and in the hearts and spirits of men. Before Jesus was resurrected, the spirit of Jesus was not yet. And can you say the spirit of Jesus? Is that correct? Is that theologically correct to say the spirit of Jesus? Actually, there is a marvelous book by Andrew Murray. Who in here knows 
Andrew Murray, his books, Absolute Surrender, they're Christian classics. Well, I happen to have the one in which he talks about this. It's called The Spirit of Christ. And it's wonderful. And I have both the old version. Uh, now, he lived in the 1800s. I have the old version and then an edited version that was written for the modern reader. And I don't know about you, but I really like the old Andrew Murray a little bit better. I can, it's English. I can read English, you know. So, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. This amplifies this far beyond to what we're doing in these messages. The Spirit of Jesus. In Jesus, the divine essence was mingled with his humanity. For the spirit of God, the divine spirit, to enter into us to mingle with our humanity, we needed something more. We needed something brand new that God was doing. When Jesus breathed on the disciples, they received not only the divine essence of the spirit of God, they receive the very spirit of Jesus. This is how Jesus is our stairway who came to take us to the Father. This is the Jesus with whom we are joined as one spirit with him. And when Jesus came into man, all of a sudden this fallen humanity was given the capacity for Jesus to live his life through people. Jesus came as the very expression of God. He said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But Paul tells us, I am crucified with Messiah. Yet I live, yet not me, but Jesus, the Messiah, lives through me. That's what Jesus made possible for us to live in entirely different humanity. The offering that we can present to the Lord now is a changed life, a transformed life. As Jesus is formed in us, Paul said to the Galatians, my little children of whom I travail in prayer again, I prevail to, I prevail in, I pray that you would be conformed to Jesus. You've been born again. Now I pray that you would be conformed to him. And this is how we live our lives during the week. This is how we, this is why we pursue accountability. How much of Jesus has been formed in you this week? How much have you been changed? Because we are saved instantly and it's instant and it's a done deal. But we are saved, but we have not come to full salvation. I think only Enoch attained that. I don't know many people who are being, who are being so conformed to Jesus that they walk off the planet because earth cannot hold them. <laughs> this is the sign that you have reached the fullness. And someday we will all be brought to that fullness. But if you're still here on earth, I can practically guarantee that you're not there yet. So what we do when we come on Sundays, we talked about the meal offering. Now, you know, in the book of Exodus, at the end of Exodus, there was a tabernacle set up. God's plan all along after the Garden of Eden and the fall was to come and tabernacle with men for him to be their God and them and, the ch and the, his children to be with him, worshiping him. And so we know all the sad history of the fall of man and all that. But finally, at the end of Exodus, there was a tabernacle. And it wasn't yet God's ideal because there was a separation in there. And there were different rooms and different degrees of distance from God. Yet here was God dwelling in the midst of his people. And then after Exodus, we have Leviticus, which I learned back when I was a baby Christian as it was all about Jesus and what everything meant. But you know what? I didn't apply any of it to me. The, except the burnt offering, I got that, that Jesus, that, um, that 
Jesus had provided redemption and forgiveness for sins and that he was the offering. Now later I learned that I was to present my own life as an offering, as a living sacrifice. But what really captured my attention was the second thing, the second offering, the meal offering, is not what Jesus did, but the meal offering, the fine flour baked into loaves, that this, yes, it represents the fine, perfect life of Jesus, but this represents the life that we live when we yield to him and let him live his life through us, that we come together on Sundays and how he's changed us during the week is an offering that we present back to God. And we say, Father God, look, look, your son is being formed in me. Lord, I yielded to Jesus when I would have lost my temper this week and you lived through me. And Lord, I didn't even get angry. Lord, at that time, I wouldn't have been able to be patient. Lord, I yielded to you, to your divine humanity in me, and patience was expressed out of me. And we know that no one can live the Christian life but Jesus. So to the extent in the song, I Surrender, do you know this is supposed to be our daily life, a life lived Jesus living in us, that we live, yet not I, but Jesus, our Messiah, lives in us. And it's not poetry, and it's not just doctrine, that this is something that we are called to practice. And it really does help when we're able to share our successes with other people and our failures. And you know what? Every one of our failures comes out of our flesh. So how do, why do we even feel condemned? What do we think we can do anyway? We can do nothing but yield. And as Dennis so often says, that we live by dying and we fight by yielding. It's all Jesus. It's a wonderfully liberating way to live. And this is what the grace of God is. The grace of God is Jesus living through us. It's not that just unmerited favor and Jesus dying for us. It's us dying to self so that he can live his life through us. The fruit of the Spirit is not signs, wonders, and miracles. The fruit of the Spirit comes out of the humanity of Jesus. Do you realize most of the life of Jesus was not in signs, wonders, and miracles? It was him living a life pleasing to God, doing chores when he was a child picking up after himself, giving people a helping hand. Most of Jesus' life wasn't spectacular. Most of it was him demonstrating his humanity. And then even after he did begin his ministry and move in signs, wonders, and miracles, he was kind to the woman at the well. He had compassion on people who'd been out in the sun all day or been walking a long distance, and he fed them. When people were worried, he says, don't worry. Your father cares about your needs. Look how he clothes even the lilies of the field. Look, he cares about one little sparrow if it falls to the ground. He presented the loving heart of Father God in the way he lived his life. And then he provided mothers. The closest thing, the closest thing that unsaved man has to the way Jesus lived is, the, is mother love. And of course, we know that God is more perfect than us even in being mothers and fathers. But it's a picture of his tender care. And it's also a picture of how he wants us to live, to not just operate in signs, wonders, and miracles, but to have intimacy with him and allow him to live through us. As a matter of fact, one of the strongest rebukes in the Bible, next to the rebukes given to the Pharisees, um, was when he says, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord? Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? I did all these cool things in your name, Jesus. But I say to you, 
depart from me. I never knew you. You practice lawlessness. What was he saying here? I care about intimate relationship. That I'm not, it's my power anyway operating through you in the gifts. I'm not impressed with your gifts. I gave them to you. What I am impressed with is your intimacy with me and how you live your life. Just think what a witness it would be to the world if the members of the churches actually acted like Jesus. What a witness. Wow. You know, really loved people. You know, how about on the road? In the stores, now it's not so bad down here in the south, but whoa, when we were up in New England doing traveling ministry, those clerks can be really rude and impatient. How about if we lived it out in real life? Do you know that's why Mahatma Gandhi did not become a Christian? He said, well, I'm impressed by their message, but I just can't get over how they live. Anybody seen Christians being mean, being harsh, being impatient? How about doing, even doing things that are dishonest, cheating on their taxes and other things? Well, you know, we're all, we will have our humanity as a fallen human being with us in a sense always, even with Jesus living through us. And I know Romans 6 says that you have died to sin and it will not have dominion over you. But the problem is it's never out of calling distance. But our salvation from it is yielding to the divine humanity of Jesus in us. And it can be as simple as saying to yourself, Jesus, when you realize you're about to say something you shouldn't say or do something you shouldn't do, just going to him, and it's not a hard thing, but it does take practice. I remember when Jesus, when, when um, Dennis was teaching me how to go to Jesus in everyday life, and it was real easy to forgive people, and that was instant. That was, that was an easy lesson to learn. What was harder was learning to abide in him and stay in peace. And peace is not just something it says in Ephesians that Jesus himself is our peace. And it's just as easy to yield to his humanity in how we live our lives as it is to live in peace. But the beautiful thing is that peace is, for, is good for us, right? I mean, it's so much better to live in the peace of God than live in anxiety or fear or whatever. But that's for us. That's for our good. Now, our, the anointing of peace that emanates from us when we're in his presence is good for others. But the humanity of Jesus, living the humanity of Jesus, is more self-giving. It's more for others. Now, where do we come to in the church? So, we live by yielding to Jesus during the week. We come together and we are presenting a corporate offering of worship to our Father. See, our worship is not just singing. The meal offering was an act of worship to God. And we present that to God. And Father God is delighted. He, say, he says, look at my children. They're becoming like my son. Look at how well they've done this week. Even if we don't fall into condemnation because we've messed up during the week, that's a good thing. That's something we can offer to God. That's what Brother Lawrence did when he took the barrels to the market and he would break five out of ten and he'd say, well, if it weren't for the grace of God, I'd have broken them all. There's now therefore no condemnation to us. And... So the question we really need to ask ourselves as we go through daily life is not what Jesus, would Jesus do, but how would Jesus live in this situation? How should we respond? Now, Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. So 
A church is not a human organization. It's something built by Jesus, right? So let me ask you this. I'm going to give you two choices. This is like you do with two-year-olds. You, you, you never ask them, give them an opportunity to say yes or no. You say, would you like the red one or the blue one? A little secret there to survive that particular year of life. <laughs> so Jesus wants to build his church. Now, he's got to have something to build with, right? So does he build with our fallen nature? Or does he build with his life that's formed in us? This is not a complicated. Our fallen nature, our flesh, flesh or life. Does Jesus build with flesh or life? Right. He builds with his life in us. So to the extent that we don't deal with our stuff, we are less appropriate building material for Jesus. And we know that Jesus gave himself for a glorious church, not just for our salvation individually, that Jesus really wants to build a church, right? So each week when we come together, we're offering back to God something he can build with. Because, see, we are living stones, but it can be theoretical or it can be reality. See, a living stone has life in it. Only Jesus is life. In him is life. God is life. He is life. He builds with life. Who in here thinks of a living stone as like a little, little, maybe whitish stone or something you'd build like a stone wall with? Well, if you look at the New Jerusalem, God builds with precious stones, formerly minerals and earth that have been put under pressure and they've been transformed into precious stones, gems and diamonds and emeralds and rubies. Those are the stones that Jesus builds with. Those are living stones. That's our destiny as people, as who we are. And pearls, a pearl is transformed through the life, the essence surrounding that irritation until it becomes something that it wasn't before. Transformation. When we're transformed, we become more and more a precious stone that Jesus can build with. Now, unfortunately, in a lot of our churches, building materials have been acquired. As a matter of fact, most, well, let's look at this. Take a look at a building. We're seeing two houses built next door to us, side by side. And we have lots of trucks dropping off building materials. And sometimes they park in front of our driveway, but we like the builder and we're practicing patience. So um, lots of materials, but they don't just leave it piled out there in the yard or um, around the building. They're doing something with it. Now, for a while there, there was so much rain, it looked like the materials were gonna sit there for a long time when they were trying to build a foundation initially. But each piece of material that they drop off now has been prepared and cut into a certain size. They're just starting to deliver windows and doors, and they don't just leave them lying around in the red clay. Workmen are coming and fitting them into place. They were made a certain size and shape for the purpose of being built together and fitted into a building. What good would it be if the materials were just left piled up there? I'm afraid that's the way it is in a lot of churches. And there, it's good to have fellowship. It's good to come together. But it's better to let Jesus build something. Not a program by, planned by man but something Jesus is doing, something that has the life of the Spirit in it. So what happens when we have the life of the Spirit? Okay, we have life. For one thing, we have actual life. Like, how many picked up on the life that was in our worship 
this morning and then the spirit moving and people having different words and and like in the new testament where it says each one has a psalm a hymn a spiritual song why because the holy spirit is allowed to move through the congregation and energize us to flow together in the spirit that's life a lot of churches don't have that we can come together and we can sing songs without life Believe me, when Dennis and I tra did traveling ministry, we sat in many worship services that didn't have much life. One time, Dennis got up, and it was so bad in there, and he said, let's sing in the Spirit and turn this around. And you know that place was filled with a spirit of worship. It was really, it was really awesome. And I hope, I hope the people in there remembered that. Because you know, once you've tasted something, you can't settle, you can't go back to the old. Once you've tasted something, the reality of something, you want that, a taste of God. Next is the glory of God there. Well, you know, there's some glory in our churches, but not like what God is getting ready to bring into our churches because I think we have entered into a time that's going to eclipse all other times in history. I think Jesus is about to begin a serious building program in our churches. He's been preparing the living stones. I've seen him positioning the living stones. I've seen him move people in. I've seen him bring people right now. He's bringing sons and daughters even into this place. He's, he's making divine connections to bring divine order. Why? So he can build with the stones he's been preparing. Do you know for the past 2,000 years there have been multitudes of believers who've had a rich, deep life with God? A lot of them have written books, but a lot of them were pretty much lone rangers in spite of them having a deep life with God, like Madame Guyon, one of the, uh, my book mentor people that touched me so deeply as a young believer but we haven't seen a lot of building yet, but I think that's the next big thing on God's agenda, agenda because he's going to build dwelling places where he can come and dwell in our midst, and it's not going to be like in the tabernacle of Moses where it was segmented. God's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David where the ark, the presence of God was right there in their midst, and they came and worshiped because David saw afar off well, I believe he saw our day. He saw afar off what was coming under the new covenant, covenant. That God, when God comes and dwells, and there's no separation, and there are no veils, his glory is there. And I know there's the glory of the Holy Spirit, and there's the glory of the anointing, but there's the glory of the Father. And I believe the Father is going to come dwell in our midst, and I believe it's not going to be one place, it's not going to be two places. I saw a vision years ago, and it was as though I was up above the earth, and I could see the, the earth spinning on its axis, and all of a sudden I saw a flash of light, and then I saw another flash of light, and then all over the earth there were little pinnacles. And when Je Jesus said, when two or three, it only takes two or three gathered together in my reality, in my name, there I am in their midst, God dwelling with his children. And I saw these little flashes of glory, and they began happening all over the earth. And the whole earth began to glow gold, just glowing gold. God is going to come and dwell in his churches but we, as living stones, have to cooperate and let ourselves be prepared. We have to let ourselves be prepared so we can fit in. One of the things about even diamonds, even precious stones, they're not done when they become a precious stone. That's when the cutting and polishing process begins. So even if we think we're, we're doing pretty good, Something has to be done to get those stones to fit together properly. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit as we cooperate with him and let Jesus be formed in us. 
Galatians 4.19, my little children, Paul said, for whom I labor in birth again, travail in birth again, until Messiah is formed in you. If you're not part of the small groups, I encourage you to get the booklet about it. Read the leader's handbook if you want. You can even take the full course on, online, on the online school. But it's all about getting us prepared. In the book of Revelation, it says the bride has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready. This is the time of making ready because God is up to something big. Now, church life. Many of us have realized that we need Jesus as our life. Many others around us have, real, have realized that person needs Jesus as their life. Husbands and wives realize, you know, each other. So what do we do, by the way? Do we criticize? You know, we can't change ourselves. If you see a need in somebody else, don't talk about them, pray for them, right? Many of us realize we need Jesus as our life, but very few realize that we need Messiah as our life so we can practice church life so we can be built together as Jesus wants us built. It's easy to find books that teach about all sorts of life, the victorious life, the abundant life, the spiritual life, the divine life, the crucified life, the overcoming life, the eternal life. But it's rare to find a book telling us that this overcoming life, this spiritual life, is for the purpose of building the church. This life is not just for personal victory, although it includes personal victory. This life has a definite purpose. This life is for building up the church as the body of Messiah. This life is for the church. We are being prepared by God to be built together into his building, his church, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And this is, this is the verse of Kingdom Life Church. This is what we're about. By the way, when, when we went to that little building that's now our, now our headquarters building, when Dennis and I first planted the church, God said to Dennis, you're not a church. I want you to create an upper room to birth a church. That's what I saw happening all over the world. There are other groups that are being prepared by God. This is going to, this is, it may start in a corner somewhere, but it's going to be a big thing and it's going to spread all over the earth because Jesus will build his church. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now you are members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows, grows, see there's life in it, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. David saw this. I, I don't think there were many others who saw it because he was the only one who had the tabernacle of David where there was no separation between God and man. David saw far into the future. And he said there doesn't have to be a separation. And he hungered for the presence of God more than anything else in his life. This one thing, this one thing. And so we're not seeking community. We're not seeking um, just discipleship. We are coming together because like David in Psalm 132, I am desperate for the presence of God. We are desperate for the presence of God. That's what it was all about. This is what happened with the Moravians. They had a Pentecost, but they weren't seeking community. They were seeking God together. There's a big difference. 
they came together as a community in seeking God. And God answered with the Pentecost, and they had the glory and the fire for 100 years, just like after the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, 100 years before the decline. See, this is more than a revival. Revivals are nice little refreshings, but we want a habitation. We want God to come and dwell and for it to last. Our part is letting the life increase in us by yielding to Jesus, the perfect man, so he can grow life in us and so we can grow life in a building as God puts us together. Now, if you look in Exodus, and I have a picture of the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle was called the tent of meeting. I love that, the tent of meeting. And the book of Leviticus is how we worship God in that tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting, you can also see a picture of the church. I know you can see a picture of the cross and what Jesus did for us. You can see all sorts of things. But let's look at it in a sort of unique way. We know the ark of God represents Jesus. The ark of God, the presence of God with the mercy seat so we can come to God, that if you really study it and study the words, the cherubim over the ark, the word there used for cherubim is not spirit, it's not angelic. The word for the cherubim there and the, and the word for the cherubim in Ezekiel's um, wheel within the wheel, vision, is the word that means flesh, raw, alive. It speaks of biological life, that over the ark of the covenant, we see the two beings with their wings touching and the glory of God there over the mercy seat on the ark. Those are two gathered together in unity and the glory is there. Jesus is there in the midst in our meeting place with God. But then if you look at the construction of the tabernacle in the next slide, the tabernacle itself, uh, the sanctuary itself, the holy place and the most holy place was covered with animal skins. But the supporting structure of both the ark and the tabernacle itself was gold overlaying wood. Wood stands for humanity that Jesus came and he was able to be our son of man and our savior because of his humanity mingled with his divine essence. But his humanity was the supporting structure that prepared him to be our savior and that allows him to be the son of man forever in the heavenly realm. The mixture together of the divine and the human. And we see that throughout the supporting structure of the tabernacle. So the ark itself was wood overlaid with gold. Now, outside the tabernacle, well, in, outside of the ark, I mean, we see boards. We see in this actually a picture of Jesus in the ark and then Jesus enlarged in a larger structure representing the church under the new covenant. Now those boards are also wood overlaid with gold. So Jesus has always had the church in mind. He's always had a spiritual house in mind. Back from eternity past, Jesus has looked ahead so it would not be Jesus, it would not just be God, but it would be Jesus is the head with his body. It would be Jesus in the church, bringing together in the new Jerusalem. We see God in the midst, and we see the worshipers surrounding the throne of God. That the head and the body, Jesus 
and the church. Now the ark is the center and the glory, Messiah himself. But God never just wanted to be alone. It was always about Father God and his children. It was all about Jesus and his church. It was all about the bridegroom and the bride. The enlarged Messiah. Jesus living his life in many temples. We're told, Nancy, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Terry, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Catherine, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. When the veil in the temple was rent, all of a sudden, God could have many expressions, not just Jesus is the expression of God. Suddenly, God was distributed into the hearts of his people. So we have, in a sense, the Ark of the Covenant in us. We have Messiah in us, our hope of glory as individuals, but Jesus wants a larger expression. He wants bodies of believers through whom the Holy Spirit can move freely. Who in here has read uh, Norman Grubb's book, Reese Howell's Intercessor? Well, chapter 31 of that book talks about how many who had tasted the glory of God were baptized into one living organism that provided the intercessory prayer power that turned the course of World War II. They were baptized into one body for a specific purpose. God wants us baptized together. So I know it's wonderful what we do here on Sunday mornings when people participate during worship and people prophesy and no song of the Lord this morning, but I can't sing or I would do it. Uh, but still, it's God's people participating as an organism. Well, I don't know what assignment God will give us when he comes to dwell in our midst. And we have a taste of unity now, but I believe it's going to increase because God has a purpose. He has something he wants to do in this region. He has particular things he wants to accomplish, whether it's intercessory prayer or evangelism or or whatever God might want to do. He has a purpose for his people, but he's got to have a body to participate in that purpose. I know he has purposes for us individually, but he wants a corporate body, a larger expression of Jesus. A larger expression of Jesus. Now, we know that there is a uniting principle. You see there are 48 standing boards around the exterior, wood covered with gold. Now, could I have the next slide? Now, there's a small picture. These boards could not stand up by themselves. These, and these, rep these boards represent overcomers, the people who are prepared, the people who are ready to, to support, be a support for the church, for the tabernacle. But there were bars that went along the sides and attached to the boards were rings of gold through which these bars fitted. Now the bars were gold overlaying wood, but the rings through which the bars slid were pure gold. It takes a joint effort. We have to come together and open our hearts to one another to be corporate, to be not just a joined to God, but joined to one another. When two people get married, it's a spiritual covenant. Their spirits are actually joined together. When the believers were in the upper room, Praying, it says they were in one accord. This is a spiritual term. It means their hearts were knit one to another. And one accord actually created a portal that allowed, as we were praying this morning, heaven to be released on earth. One accord creates a portal. And later, when the believers again were in one accord, it says the Holy Spirit rushed in such power that it shook the house while they were praying that this is what the Bible talks about, being prayers of agreement. 
spirits that are open, that agree spiritually on something, not just head agreement. So the Bible talks about believers who are allowing themselves to be set in place and built together. In Ephesians, it calls it the bond of peace. and talks about endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So see, there's always a cooperation with what the Holy Spirit's doing. Now, the rings of gold are pure spirit. But the bars allowing themselves to be slid through the rings to make bonds or connections, that's humanity and divinity mixed together. Wood overlaid with gold. So Jesus wants to build, and I know he's going to give more clues, more specifics, because it's like, and I have looked. Aside from the writings of Count von Zinzendorf and writings like that, I can't find any books on how Jesus does the building. Actually, we've been prophesied that we'll be writing some books about that. But we have some pictures in the book of pictures itself, the Old Testament, that gives us some clues on how this is done. And we have some suggestions by Paul in lowliness of heart, having patience with one another, and other keys to let Jesus build. So we know God is already preparing the stones. He's already bringing the stones together. We know that God is, is turning divine appointments into divine connections, and he's beginning to bring divine order because Jesus is going to build his church with those who cooperate with him in the building process. So we have two needs here. We have the life that Jesus needs to build with as we cooperate with him and let him birth life in us. And then we have the cooperation as Jesus begins to build. And Count von Zinzendorf watched how the Holy Spirit was knitting people together, bringing people together, those divine connections, and he cooperated with the process, and he encouraged them to cooperate with the process. So we encourage you to cooperate with the process as God works in you every week, and let us share in your victories and triumphs. We'll rejoice with you. And if you need prayer about something, let us also mourn with you and help you. That's what the body is, is supposed to do anyway. We're brothers and sisters of one another. And let's be aware of what God is doing so God can birth. And so our Father can come dwell with his children. Amen. Uh -huh. I want to close with... <coughs> Whoops. Oh, we have a little interaction with our microphones. A little, little interaction. I want to close with, with uh, two thoughts. Um, first of all, when I was a young pastor, God put me in... I've had several open visions in my life, but only one where it was actually what we would call a trance. An open vision means your eyes are wide open, not, not your mind's eye. And God showed me a structure for building. And it was to me, it's a heavenly plan, so it was his structure. But here is what he kept me, and I'm glad he did. He focused on, Dennis, there are four levels. Do not be discouraged when people won't go beyond the second level. People will come and go in your life. The first level was teach them their personal identity, the new creation realities. Secondly, teach them that they have an anointing that abides within, that's equipping. Teach them you have an anointing, it abides in you. Don't rely always on other people. He said, but the third level, you're gonna see them come and go. And the third level is a corporate identity. It terrifies the rugged individual. They settle for their who they are in Jesus and their anointing, their gifting, whatever. 
Getting them to move into a corporate identity strikes fear into their heart because they feel that they're somehow going to lose their identity if they become part of something bigger, all right? But God told me, and I saw it come and go. The fourth area then would be from that corporate identity, I can release the assignment that I've made for them corporately that no individual can do by themselves. You cannot have a corporate anointing by yourself. <laughs> All right? But divine appointments become divine connections. Follow the pattern here. It's simple. Divine appointments. And you don't even sometimes know who they are. You have to learn to cooperate and forbear with one another. Divine appointments, divine connections. Divine connections becomes a divine order. And that's where God is building by the Spirit, and it's supremely above whatever you or I would think or choose. That divine order is also a divine assignment. But he's not going to, many are called, but few are commissioned. Few are given the assignment because they've not come together. That the time for the coming together for the divine assignment is now. If I was in the tribe of Issachar, that's where I would belong because for this is the season. They were knowledgeable about the signs of the times. And I'm telling you, all of a sudden, don't be surprised if you hear this from other people, all of a sudden, there's going to be a new love for the church. Because you can't say you love God as these people I can't stand, right? Here's the anointing that's going to infiltrate the church before the glory is really going to settle. Here is the anointing. When, and I don't know a whole lot of Christians that this scripture means anything to, to be honest. Outside of Jennifer and I, this is our passion. May this become your passion. Ask Ask, you, ask the Holy Spirit, is this, is this in me? Do I identify with this statement? Is this my passion? But in Psalm 132, O Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob, I will not come into my house, nor will I go up to my bed, nor will I give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling of the mighty God of Jacob. I don't play church. If I wanted numbers, there's stuff you can do to get numbers. I want reality. I want real relationships. I want healthy people who can stand on their own and reproduce according. You can only reproduce according to your kind, and you can only give what you have. You can't give something you don't have. And God's got something for the body of Christ. It's going to be a deeper, richer love for His body. Find out where your DNA is. Find out where your tribe is and become part of something bigger than yourself and don't be afraid of losing your identity in the midst of it. That is carnality, that you're so afraid that my gift and I can't find my niche. That's more about you than it is about God, isn't it? You find out that I want to please God and He'll put it together in ways far supreme to any of your ways. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for an impartation that there's going to be people who are going to transfer. No matter how long they've been in the body, they're going to move beyond who they are in Jesus. They're going to move beyond their particular anointing, and they're going to move into the corporate anointing so that they can be part of the assignment that God has prepared beforehand. He has no plan B. He has one plan, the church. There's no plan B. Church is corporate, the ecclesia, those that have been called out and assembled for governance, for rulership, to take charge, to commit, be commissioned, to do what God has called us to do. So I say until that happens, we'll know what the instruction of what to do. But first, I think first things first. First, we need to become part of something bigger than ourselves and be willing to surrender ourselves humbly. And I've been teaching on the Psalms of Ascent, even when we were in Israel. Those 15 steps, Psalm 120 to 134, is a maturation. But where God's got us now is 132. He can't let the brethren, Psalm 133, you're not ready for 133, where the brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing that flows down from the beard to the whole body to be the blessing. You're not there yet because... You've got to be Psalm 132. This is where the Spirit of the Lord's got the entire church, as far as I'm concerned, around the world. Until you will not give sleep to, or slumber to your eyes, till you see, I want to be part of that dwelling place of God, and I realize that as a living stone, I need to fit. I need to be fit together. I need to know where my tribe is, where my ministry is, where, what, what's called, but don't get stuck on you and your ministry. 
because you can be effective as a Lone Ranger. Those people that were rebuked by Jesus were effective. You know what? If you really have supernatural satisfaction, when God took me to the school of the Spirit, He says, the first thing that I noticed that when I have personal satisfaction in my relationship with Him, you, it should trigger a, a, a reciprocation. If you're really satisfied in Jesus, you should want to reciprocate and satisfy His heart. And it's no longer concern about what satisfies you. But it's that I want to bring pleasure to the heart of God no matter what that is. We're coming into this season where God's, God is, is, is bringing to life Psalm 132 on the steps of progression to maturity. And now remember where Psalm 120 starts out? If you're any of you like that, we have house groups for you. Psalm 120 is, help God, get me out of this mess. That's the bottom though. That is not the overcomers. I want to go to Psalm 134, the top of the steps, to where this is the place of the blessing. This is where Zion blesses Jerusalem. This is where the overcomers bless the entire church. You are blessed to be a blessing. Are we going to move on to step 134? I didn't lose you on the steps, right? You know those? It's a progressive maturity, 120 to 134. The priest sang on the 15 steps. And they would go up. And it's clearly a maturation process. What step are you on? Have you stopped at a particular step and you don't want to move forward? As for me and my house, we're going up, right? And if God did it with Jennifer and I, where two or more are gathered together, He can do two or more, He can do four. I don't even think it's going to be uh, it, by the hundreds. It's going to be God is going to orchestrate building material. He's going to bring blocks together. It's just like the house they're building next to us. It's not all done in one day, but it's beautifully ordered. And if the Lord says, I will build my church, we better let Him present the order and the timing. But right now, God has promised us, there's, there's people like April, relocated. She's had our DNA for years, and all of a sudden, she got a job here locally. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.